Welcome to the Social Engineer Podcast, the Human Element Series. This is episode 194. I can't even believe I'm saying that number. That's a really high number. I'm Chris Hadnagy, CEO and founder of Social Engineer LLC, the Innocent Lives Foundation, as well as social-engineer.org and the Institute for Social Engineering. And I've been hosting this podcast since 2009 when many of you didn't even know what podcasting was. That's crazy. I feel old now. If you're looking for any information or resources on social engineering, such as adversarial simulations, risk assessments, vishing, phishing services, you should check out our brand new website. We just got done redoing it. I got to thank Jason for all the work he put into it and Patrick. And you can check it out at social-engineer.com and you can find out more information about what we do there as the sponsor of this show. And if you love the topic of social engineering and you're looking for a place to come and talk about it, uh, we have a Slack channel. Now there's, I think, over 1,200 people in there. They're talking about the psychology behind it, phishing, vishing. Uh, we even have a job board where many people have found employment and changed their careers uh, thanks to coming into the Slack channel. So you can check it out in the show notes or find the Human Hacker Twitter account, and it's, uh, it's posted there. You can get into the Slack channel. Uh, talking about the Innocent Lives Foundation, I want to encourage everyone who's listening to check out innocentlivesfoundation.org. I am so proud of the team over there. Uh, it's going just on five years now that, that we've been working hard with law enforcement around the globe to stop people who traffic children and who harm children and create child sex abuse material. Uh, we are now over 450 cases turned into federal law enforcement, and I cannot be prouder of that fact that we are helping uh, catch people who are really hurting kids. So if you want to support us, you can come over and volunteer, or of course we can use donations. You can find out more information at innocentlivesfoundation.org. And last but not least, uh, on the topic of ILF, one of our amazing board members is Neil Fallon. And if you don't know that name, shame on you. He is the lead singer of the best rock and roll band on the planet Earth, Clutch. You can check them out. They're on tour. New album coming out, pro-rock.com or go to clutchmerch.com. You can check them out and listen to their new songs. They're amazing. Love their band. I've been a fan of them since I was 17. And they're now helping ILF with all the things that they do. So we, of course, love them even more. And they gave us the music that we get to use for this podcast. Okay, let's get to the meat of the show here. I'm really excited about this one. Uh, Robert Kerbeck is our guest today. And he's the founder of the Malibu Writer Circle. He's a lifetime member of the Actor Studio and a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania. But this is why we have him here. You may think, oh, that's impressive. But he wrote a book. It's called Ruse, Lying the American Dream from Hollywood to Wall Street. And it's about his secret career as a corporate spy. What does that even mean? We're going to find out. Okay, he's received praise from Frank Abengale, former CIA agent uh, Valerie Plame. And, and uh, Robert's work has been uh, mentioned in so many different publications like the Los Angeles Times, San Francisco Chronicle, Los Angeles Magazine, Lit Hubs, Crime Radio and on and on. And we have Robert here to talk about the book and what it means to be a corporate spy. Thanks for coming on the show, Robert. Oh, Chris, I'm so glad to be here because, you know, social engineering, you know, I mean, I could have called my book social engineering, you but, <laughs> but what I call, you know, ruse, rusing is really social engineering. And that's what we as corporate spies did. So uh, this is the perfect place for me to be. And I'm so glad to be here. Okay. I love that you said we as corporate spies. Okay. So this makes it sound like there's a group of you. So let's, let's first ask the question, how do you even become a corporate spy? Well, um, what happened for me is um, I grew up in Philadelphia. My family is very well known in the automobile business in Philadelphia. Uh, my great grandfather sold horse carriages before cars were invented. Um, he became the, one of the first uh, car dealers in Philadelphia. My grandfather took over that dealership. My father took over that dealership and I was supposed to take over that dealership. And when I graduated college, I had done some plays and I kind of got really into acting. But when I graduated, I was too chicken to move to New York. That just seemed so insane. And so I went to work for my father. And um, I just found that the trickery of car sales, whatever, it, it just didn't feel right to me. The dishonesty didn't feel right to me. So, of course, I go to New York to try to be an actor. Actors need survival jobs. And who stumbles into a job as a corporate spy, uh, which is what I did. And obviously, it was far more dishonest than car sales. I would, Im I would imagine. But how does one stumble into a job as a corporate spy? Yeah. So a, a buddy of mine, uh, his brother was my college roommate. He was in New York. He offered to show me the ropes. And one day he kind of mentioned this job and then he shut up about it right away. And I said, hey, man, you, you know, I need a job. Well, what, what's this job you got? Oh, I, I can't talk about it. I can't talk about it. And so right away, there was something mysterious about it. 
And um, so I forced him. He got me an interview. He really didn't tell me what the job was. I assumed it was some sort of telemarketing. And I go for this interview on the Upper East Side. And as your listeners may know, the Upper East Side of Manhattan is kind of the ritziest area of Manhattan, doorman, luxury building. I take the elevator up to the penthouse. This woman opens the door. I seem to remember she had a cigarette and a martini, but maybe that's just my writer imagination. Um, but she invites me into the fanciest apartment I'd ever seen, maybe still have ever seen. Everything was white. Everything was pristine. So I knew whatever she did, it was lucrative. Right. I knew she was making a lot of money. And so we have the most bizarre interview I've ever done. She never asked me anything about my background, my skill set. She didn't ask for my resume. The only thing she was concerned about was that I had left my father's car business and she wanted to know how he was taking that. Um, and I left. Um, sure, I didn't get the job. And then my buddy called up and said, you got the job. And I was momentarily very excited. And he said, don't get excited. She hires everyone because no one is able to do this job. <laughs> and then I began the next day I went to work and I began my training and apprenticeship as a corporate spy and quickly learned what we were hired to do. What we were tasked to do was to go into major American corporations and find out anything and everything that their competitors wanted to know about them. Right. Um, you know, we all know the Russians spy on the Chinese, the Chinese spy on us. But what most people have been shocked to find out, and apparently my book is the first book to really write about this, is how much money American corporations spend every year on hiring spies to find out secrets on their on their main rivals. So I imagine this involves you having to go get a job at the competitive company. Well, we that's called going inside internal. And we did do that at times. But remember, most of the spying I was doing was 90s and aughts. And so in the era before LinkedIn, uh, the New York Post uh, wrote a review of the book and they said that I was LinkedIn before LinkedIn was invented. Right. And so back in the day, you could actually call these firms Right. And you would call them and we being actors, because everyone this woman hired, um, were, they, we were all trying to be actors. So we had the ability to do accents, to create personalities, to create personas, to imitate the voices of executives that we watched on CNBC. And so we would portray ourselves as executives. At least that was that was my go to ploy. Uh, everybody had a different ploy that worked better for them. Um, I would be a fellow executive. I was off site. There was an emergency. There was a crisis. We were meeting with the U.S. regulators uh, and we needed this information and we needed you to save the day because you're a good corporate teammate and you want me on your side as your friend because I'm a senior executive and this is going to be good for your career. Right. And and these are all the things I'm sure you tell people yes. not to do. These are all the red flags. These are all the alerts. And I want to tell you something right now. None of them ever stopped me ever. And this, so in essence, what you said in the very beginning, that what you do is, is social engineering. This is exactly yeah. what we yeah. do. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. but, yeah. but so, okay. I have a million questions. Is this, is this legal? Ah, I'm sorry. You faded out there for a second, Chris. I couldn't hear it. <laughs> uh, great question. I mean, look, I think, I think the word would be quasi illegal. Um, okay. I'm, you know, um, when we first started doing this years and years ago, uh, my buddy and I got a little nervous because, you know, we were just doing this support our, to support ourselves as, as actors. When we first started doing this, we were getting $8 an hour. Okay. Now that seems ludicrous what? to me now. Yes. And it seems ludicrous that we were putting ourselves in jeopardy for such a small yes. amount of money. But eventually I was making millions of dollars a year doing okay. this job. So millions. Did you, you make money for the secrets that you uncover? For everything. Yeah. For all of the intelligence. And I'll go into specifically what that intelligence was. But, um, you know, so we weren't really doing it for the money. So we were nervous. Yeah. And so we went and we met with an attorney and the attorney said, um, uh, it was in the gray area. And then he paused and said, very dark gray. <laughs> um, and so I think that the answer is, uh, yes, it was illegal. Uh, and it certainly was unethical. And uh, I'm not proud of the job. I've never been proud of the job, but it is one hell of a crazy story. It is a crazy and, story. And at one point, well, no, more than, I mean, at multiple points, we were being hunted by the largest authorities in America, 
Um, and at one point we were confused with the most famous hacker in America and every agency with three letters, FBI, CIA, SEC, right? All of them thought that we were this hacker, me and my buddy, because we kind of were a team, we worked together um, and they were all coming after us. And at that moment, I thought that I had misjudged um, completely how serious this, what we were doing was. And, um, and that was pretty scary because that individual that the authorities were hunting was eventually arrested as a domestic terrorist and went to jail for many, many years. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Are you talking about Kevin? Kevin. Yeah. yeah. Kevin Mitnick. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So you, yeah. this is an interesting collision of stories because I've had yes, Kevin on the right. show. I know Kevin. Yeah. And, and the fact that you are like, they confused you for him. Yes. Because you, yeah, were, you were doing everything on the phone. In essence. We, yeah, we were doing all the same stuff that Kevin yeah. was doing, but you know, Kevin theoretically, you know, and in his book, he talks about, he was only doing it for like the thrill of the chase yeah. to be able to say that, Hey, I hacked into sprint or I hacked into AT and T or whatever he was doing. Right. But we were doing it for money. So theoretically, if anybody should have gotten in trouble, it should have been us and not Kevin. <laughs> right. right? Um, and uh, yeah. So, you know, I, I, I like to tell people I'm the Kevin Mitnick that did not get caught. <laughs> Okay, so in your book, uh, there's a lot of, of celebrities who've made appearances in the book. I mean, you got J-Lo, Paul Newman, George Clooney, Madonna, Kevin Spacey, Al Pacino. There's just the list goes on and on. Uh, are there some favorite celebrity stories from the book that, that you can tell? Ah, uh, sure. Well, you know, again, I was an actor. This job was only to support me. And I was working all the time. You know, I have a, a pension from the Screen Actors Guild. I had a major an agent and manager. I did over 50 major uh, lead roles in, in TV shows. Um, but the craziest story was that at one point, my manager called me and he said, hey, um, this woman's looking for some um, some guys to be in this uh, exercise video. Do you want to be in this exercise video? The money's pretty good. And, and they give you new sneakers. And at the time, mine had holes in them. And uh, I said, no, I said, I can't. I, I'm not a dancer. I don't, I'm the worst dancer ever. I can't do the exercise video. And he was like, oh, okay, well, you know, it's with OJ Simpson. But if you don't want to do it, I said, wait, whoa, 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 OJ Simpson. <laughs> And he said, yeah, it's an exercise video for men. Uh, you know, it's not dancing. You're going to do push-ups, pull-ups, probably play pickup basketball, <laughs> do some crunches. And so I show up to do this workout video with OJ Simpson and quickly find out that it is a dance video. Um, <laughs> and we're doing aerobics. And oh the, chor the choreographer wants to fire me. But I'm so bad at dancing that my dancing is making OJ Simpson look great. <laughs> And so OJ Simpson says, no, 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 no. Rob's making me look good. We got to keep Rob. And I know. And he became like my best friend. He loved me. At one point, he takes me to the side and he says, hey, do you want to see this new pilot I just shot for NBC? It's called Frogman. I play a knife expert in it. True story. Um, and um, and as you can imagine, so, you know, we work very closely together. And a week later, I'm watching TV when he's in the Bronco on the run on the 405 freeway, trying to escape, I guess, to Mexico running from the authorities because of the double murders that he, in my humble opinion, committed. Yeah. Um, so, and of course, what was crazy is the exercise video was then introduced into evidence in his trial <laughs> because he was saying he was too infirm to kill anyone. And then they're showing a video of him and me and everybody doing push-ups. And I'm here to tell you, I'm six foot one. Back then, I weighed 190 pounds. I was all muscle. I was a twig next to OJ Simpson, who was like an oak. Yeah. Right. Um, and then finally, like OJ never went away from me. Like my whole life, OJ, that experience has followed me. A few years ago, they did a TV series about OJ with Cuba Gooding playing OJ. They recreated the exercise video for the show, no. which means an actor got hired to play me <laughs> and and to and to and to mimic my bad dancing. <laughs> <laughs> and who did they choose? Anybody great? <laughs> no, nobody great. Nobody great. <laughs> they, nobody they great. They could have chose you. <laughs> Yeah, I was I was a little long in the tooth by then, but thank 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 you for the vote of confidence, Chris. <laughs> oh man, that that's a crazy story. Yeah. I mean, your life so far feels like one crazy story after yeah. another. Like, yeah. Well, you know, uh what do they say? Truth is stranger than fiction. Yeah. And uh I'm here to tell you that I wrote a true story about lying, 
right? Um, uh, everything in the book is true. Everything in the book happened, but it is crazy, which is why, um, you know, Frank Abagnale read the book um, and he flipped over it. He wrote me a blurb, which is on the cover. Um, he's been a huge supporter. He's recommended me now. I've done speaking uh, gigs because of Frank Abagnale. Um, and uh, in no small part, due to his uh, support, now Hollywood got interested and now Ruse is in development for a TV series. Congratulations on all of that, by the yeah, way. Thank you. So what kind of information do you get as a corporate spy? Like what, what's, what's so valuable? Yeah, so we always started with the organizational chart. Now, remember, pre-LinkedIn, there was no way to find out anything about anybody who worked at a firm, who was on a team, who the rock stars were at the firm, right? Who were the guys that were the guys and gals that were bringing in tons of money, the top salespeople, the top traders, the top bankers, right? Um, so we would do all that. We would build out these org charts and we would learn that almost all firms have some sort of internal metric to rank their employees. So we would learn what that metric was. So we would learn how these employees ranked, were ranked by their own company. Then we would learn their salaries. So then we would learn, oh, wait, this guy is ranked number two on this team, but he's a young guy and he's only making this there's a great person for a rival to steal because they're going to get a super talented rock star who's in the early stage of their career. And, you know, P your, and your listeners, because they're pretty sophisticated, they're going to have a sense of how valuable yeah. that was. But yeah. but just to, to bring it home, imagine, you know, Steve Jobs, legendary CEO of Apple. He refused to let his designers be listed in the Apple directory because he did not want them poached. Because imagine mm. if you could poach one of the designers of the iPad in the early days, how much money would that have been worth? Yeah. Right? How many billions of dollars would yeah. that have been worth? Right. And so the type of intelligence that we were gathering and corporate spies still gather today, because I'm here to tell you, LinkedIn has about 60 percent of people on LinkedIn, 60 percent accurate. You're still maybe maybe, you know, on a good day, 70 percent. But for the most part, LinkedIn is still missing a third of individuals or a third of accurate information. And the people that were hiring me, they don't want 60%. They don't want 70%. They don't want 80%. They don't want 90%. They want 99.9% .9 of the information exactly correct as it is that day. So how would you right? go about get like, I'm still trying to just put the dots together because now it seems easy yeah. with the internet, with LinkedIn, with, I mean, you could go to Rocket Mail or whatever and you just pay 25 bucks and all of a sudden you're getting an org chart on companies that's been developed through corporate research. But you're right. doing this before those days existed. How? Correct. But I'm telling you, e even today, <laughs> that information that you're, you're getting from wherever, uh, you know, it, it's, you'd be lucky if it's 50% accurate, 60% accurate, you know, and when you're, when you're working with the biggest corporations in America, and I'm telling you that the biggest corporations in America, are, like I said, are hiring spies every day. <laughs> they don't want, they want it all. They want to know everything. And then once you've built that, that org chart, right, then they want this layering. I call basically the org chart org chart on steroids, where you begin to put in things like, what is the firm doing? Where are they spending money? Are they expanding? Are they increasing their headcount? Are they decreasing their headcount? What what products are in the pipeline? You know, what what are they looking to develop? What are their strat? Like mm -hmm. all of this other stuff, right? Which is not anywhere, right? But you need the org chart because the org chart enables the social engineer, the ruser, to seem so knowledgeable, right? Because I'm able to say, hey, Chris. You're saying, well, hey, whatever name I'm giving you, hey, I, well, how do I know you're really who? Well, you know, I know, you, you know, you run a team of seven people, which includes Pete, Tom, Sarah and Neil. And by the way, Neil and I went to college together because I've looked up Neil on LinkedIn and I see where he went to college. You know, you say, well, where did he go to college? Well, I, mean, I know I went to BYU. Oh, well, you must you see all of this information that now I've answered every question you have, you know. You know, and by the way, I've contacted you on your cell phone. So you're like, wow, this guy's got my cell phone. He knows everything about me. Well, he must be somebody from the Denver office that I haven't met. He must be the executive vice president in Los Angeles that I've heard so much about. But I've, I was on one conference call with, but I, I don't know him. Per you know what I mean? Yeah. So we would try to pick people that you would know of, but not know personally. Yeah, yeah that makes a lot of sense. 
That makes yeah. a lot of sense. And I could see how Sca- that would the scary be. sense. It is. It, it, it is scary sense. And I could see how valuable that would be. Like, you know, thinking about that for my competitors, if I understood those details, you would know mm-hmm. what chess move to pl- to play next in order to to beat, to win the game. Yeah. yeah. It, it, it's like it's yeah. like knowing what your opponent's thinking about the next move they're going to make before they make it. Correct. And, you know, I, I did an event with uh, former CIA agent Valerie Plame, and I was talking about how much research we would do before each phone call. And she said, well, it was the same thing for the CIA. Like before they put an operative in the field, that operative does a insane amount of research, understanding anything and everything about the culture, the, you know, yeah. the, the, the world they're going into what they, you know, and it was the same thing for rusing. You know, we would do you know, we're not just picking up the phone and making some stupid kooky call. We are studying. We are studying your firm. We're reading the press rep- reports. We're reading the annual reports. We're studying your website. We're studying your locations. We're looking at LinkedIn. We're doing all of this stuff so that we seem, you know, I, I like to say that my lies sound better than your truth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that. Oh man, yeah, I, I understand when the when the the publisher said that you were LinkedIn before LinkedIn was LinkedIn. I mean that yeah. that's a, that's how we use it now. But right. you were obviously way more accurate. Yeah, and still today way more accurate because you know LinkedIn. You know, I mean it's it's it was genius that you know uh, somebody had the idea of look we're going to have people put their information on here now. What shocked me in the beginning with LinkedIn was how much information people would put on there that was basically sensitive corporate information. I run a team of 32. I just closed the deal with such and such for $18.4 million. We have six offices, but are opening three more next week and blah, 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 blah. Like they were, and you know, they were basically telling competitors things. Now, of course, uh, corporate security, compliance, HR have gotten wise to wait a second, young people. Um, you cannot overshare about our corporation on LinkedIn. And here are parameters when you do post on social media about things we don't want you talking about. Right. You know, um, it, it's interesting to me because um, <clears throat> so obviously we do very similar things, but for different reasons. Like we a company will hire us to see if we can get this kind of information out of their employees. So we're not doing it to their competitors, but I'm thinking about like that same ruse you just said, where we'll call a a, a company up and we'll see if we can get this guy to give over information. And we use the LinkedIn, LinkedIn, he's on there and he says, I run a team and I I do all the SQL databases for this giant bank. So we'll call up as someone from a different department and say, hey, what version of uh, SQL are we using? You know, I need to know this question. That enables us for now the hack that we may institute inside the, just like, I understand that this is so valuable. Like this is amazingly valuable. I just can't like doing it for the competition. Like I know we're not going to get in trouble because I'm calling the company that's asked us to call. Right. You have that whole fear factor. You're doing it and you don't have the permission. So you get caught. It's like, there's no consequences for me if I get caught. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And look, uh, by the way, you know, I, I've written this book now because the statute of limitations mm-hmm. has expired on any potential crimes that I've written. I'm here to tell you I'm not rusing today. <laughs> I haven't been rusing for quite some time. I wouldn't be a very good spy if I wrote a book right. about spying and continued to spy. I was just thinking right? about that. Um, you wouldn't be yeah, very good. You'd be you know, in prison. But, <laughs> that's right. But I am now asked all the time to do the type yeah. of work that you just described, where it's basically, hey, can you penetrate my yeah. firm? Uh, and the answer is, um, yeah, um, no problem. I mean, you know, I'm asked to find out stuff. I'm asked people to input um, cr- their credentials into their system and access things using their passwords. Yeah. Um, all the time I do that. And um, it is it is amazing because, as you well know, the weakest part of computer security isn't the firewall, isn't the network, isn't the server, isn't the encryption. It's the human being. Right. And so what I do is I hack people. And I'm here to tell you hacking people is pretty easy. And if corporations don't put as much focus on the training of their employees, the training and education of their employees as they do on their system servers, et cetera, et cetera, um, they're going to continue to have massive breaches. It's a uh, you and I sound like we're 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 brothers 
brothers mm. from other mothers, right? Because that's, that's, these, are the, <laughs> these are the things I say all the time. And the hardest part is yeah. convincing corporations that, that this is truth and not a sales pitch. You know, some right. reason they, they look at this and they go, well, of course you're going to say that this is what you, this is what you do, you know? And I'm yeah. like, you know, but yes, this is what we do. But I'm also, well, it's like a doctor saying, Hey, you should lose some weight. Uh, so you can live longer. He's not telling you that. So you keep giving him money. He's telling you that because it's truth, you know? <laughs> right. But I, I think, you know, I've been finding a lot of uh, uh, corporations are very receptive when you're able to tie it to uh, revenue loss, right? You're able to directly say, hey, look, look at this information I got. I've documented who your rock stars are on a particular team that provides some of the greatest revenue for your firm. And I now know who these people are, how much they make, how you're, how they're ranked internally. Again, if it's a sales team or a trading team, you know, wall street, whatever. Um, and now I'm able to sell this information to your biggest rival. And if they poach some of these people, you know, you're going to lose, look at how much money you're going to lose. And all of a sudden people start to see. So that's one thing. And the other thing of course is ransomware, right? Um, Which is now corporations are, are, you know, it's not just that they have a breach and they have to send out a letter to consumers. It's that now they have to pay money, right? You know, hard money that they're not going to get back. um, um, You know, unless their insurance company is very friendly, Um, you know, they might get back once, but then after that, yeah. the insurance company is going to say, you've got to, you've got to batten down your systems because we're not paying an insurance settlement for ransomware again. The right? loss. Um, I mean, just the loss that occurs because of ransomware, even if the yeah, insurance company right. covers it. I mean, how many companies can afford, I'm a small company, but you shut me down for three days. That's catastrophic right. loss. Right? If, I, right? if I have to tell that's my right. clients, hey, I can't service the services you paid me for, I can't do them for the next two weeks because we got ransomware. Right. I don't know if right. I recover from that. Right. That's right. no, I mean, you, no, no, you don't. It's a small business. You don't. And you know what, you know, and that's one of the things I wonder if we're going to start seeing um, not with big corporations, most likely, but with small corporations. And I'm glad you're sitting down <laughs> when I tell you this one. Um, there are, in my humble opinion, examples of ransomware being supported by rivals to corporations. I, I, be- I believe that because we see it <clears throat> in my work. I see it in nation state all the time, right? In nation right. states all the right. time. I mean, co- co- countries are using ransomware against other countries as an effective means yep. of, of just getting the data. Um, they don't even care about right. the money at times. You know, they just they just want they just right. want the data. It makes sense that we would yeah. see this in, in corporate espionage also. Yeah. I mean, think about it. If you could shut your rival down, like you said, for three days, cost them a tremendous amount of, ton, uh, of time and money, ruin their reputation, yeah. right? Are the people that work for that firm now going to be much more likely to quit and come work for you? Yes. Are the clients yeah. of that firm much going to be much more likely to leave that firm and come and, come and, and, and bring their business to yeah. you? Yes. Right. Uh, you know, all because you hired some hackers yeah. to to, uh, you know, breach their yeah. system. That's just um, when my sales guy happens so yeah, to call so, that company to say, hey, we want to know if you need new services. I mean, they're going to be more right. likely to say, yes, let's talk about that because their their vendor just got shut down. Yeah. So yeah. Do, do corporations admit ever to, to hiring spies? No. No. And they almost always, in my experience, personal experience, they're hiring me through an intermediary. Um, Mm -hmm. They're never hiring me directly so that they have plausible deniability. Though I'm here to tell you, I have sat in the room with people that today are the COOs and CEOs of major corporations, and I presented my stolen data personally to them. That has to be hard. But they would say we had no idea. We we never heard of such a thing. We would never if we if we had known it was stolen. We never blah 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 blah. Yeah, we thought right? it was just a competitive intelligence we paid for, right? Correct. <laughs> you were just giving us a competitive Correct. intelligence report, right? I mean, that that's exactly. All. <laughs> yeah, that's as long it. as you hire through a third party, I, I didn't know that it was a spy. I thought it was a competitive intelligence firm. Those those are legal. Yeah. They're all over the yeah. internet. Yep. Wow, yep. man, this. 
Yeah, I, I, I'm really enjoying this because I, you know, I knew because I, I knew about you because you know you're you're one of the Thank pioneers you. in podcasting and also one of the pioneers with social engineering discussions and knowledge, right? And you know, I knew you know you, you know you know you knew Kevin and I knew and so I was so excited about this because I just knew our worlds have so much um, yeah. in common, right? Um, so this has really yeah, been way, enjoyable. Way more in common than I ever th- I ever would have thought, right? I, um, <laughs> but fascinating too to be able to now look at the other side of of that world that you were in yeah. and use that knowledge to bring some security and education to folks like like what you're doing in your well, book and, yeah, what I did in the book and what I'm doing on these podcasts I just came back from RSA I spoke uh, nice. uh, twice there um, um, and you know um, again thanks to Frank Abagnale I'm being asked to speak at other um, conferences to try to help corporations realize forget about this problem going away mm-hmm. it's getting worse Right. Uh, The ransomware attacks are more serious, more dangerous, more expensive. And so if you don't have somebody like me that was on the offense, right, coming over and showing you how to play defense, um, you're going to have a big problem. Because if I can get somebody in some far flung office to put in their credentials into your system and tell me anything I want to know, all the all the you know firewall protection in the world is worthless. A hundred percent. Right. And we we say this all the time all the time to clients. I mean, we, I, I told this story yeah. before, but we were breaking into a highly secured building, of course, at their request. And we knew that once we got into the building, we had four minutes, four minutes for the alarms before mm-hmm. the police got there. So we say, let's, let's see how much we can do in four minutes. You can't even make this mm-hmm. kind of stuff up. We breach the door, the alarm doesn't go off, but I'm like, maybe it's silent. So we set our, we set our our clocks and we go running through the building. I turn right around a corner and there's the door to the knock, the network operations command center with a wooden wedge in it and a handwritten sign that says, uh, power went down, alarm system not working. I left this open in case you need to get in. It was for a server guy who was coming later that night. They left the network operations door wedged in case the electricity didn't come back on so it wasn't locked. Now I'm in the server room without having to pick a lock, without having to breach an alarm with endless amounts of time because the alarms were shut off. So no cops are coming. We ransack that place. And and it was human, right? It wasn't, yes, the the electricity failed, technology failed, but we still would have been locked out if the human either had stayed to guard the door or let it lock, right? (laughs) But but because the human decided to do the bad thing, the whole job right. went too easy. Now, now imagine if I don't have any cameras right. to worry about. I don't have right. four minutes to, to be concerned about. I don't have to worry about a door being wedged or not. I'm calling the guy sitting in that room and I'm portraying myself as the new hire deputy chief information security officer that he has not met yet. And I'm calling to introduce myself. I've heard great things about you, blah, 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 blah. I'm so excited to be on the team. And oh, by the way, I just have one question for you. La, 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 la. Oh, great. Oh, wait. And one other thing I need to know. Oh, and, and one more thing I need to know. Oh, and, and, and can you look this up? Right. And it goes on and on and on. I don't even need to, to no. be there physically. Wow. Yeah. I don't need a password. I don't, like I said, I don't need, I don't need to know how to hack your server. I'm hacking the human beings who are in charge of the servers. What year, what years was all this taking place? This is all nineties through, uh, the, okay. the, the crash, you know, when the, when the, when the crash came 2008, 2009, 2010, you know, uh, and this is all in the book. I, I kind of began to reevaluate, you know, where life had led me. And, and that's kind of when I circled back to writing, you know, and I'd started out as an English major in college um, and all of a sudden, but I couldn't sit still. And so all of a sudden later in life, I circled back and I was like, wait a second. Yeah, I don't want to do this anymore. Um, I had a child and my child heard me on the phone doing some of my crazy stories, probably heard my, you know, my, my uh, German accent. <laughs> this is Gerhard calling from the Frankfurt office. They have the European Union regulators here and they need some help. Right. Um, and by the way, one of the crazy things is the more outlandish the ruse, the more outlandish the accent, the more outlandish the story, the more oh. believable it was. Right. It's, it's kind it of is. counterintuitive. It right. Is. You go, wait a second. 
but people would hear an accent and they, and the firm, you know, these firms have all, offices all over the world and they go, Oh, that's the guy in Frankfurt. Oh, Hey, great to talk to you. Or that's the guy in Dublin. Oh, wonderful. Your Irish accent. I love it. Right. And, and all of a sudden you have this rapport and people are just going to tell you anything and everything because they have no reason to suspect you. Who's calling you putting on an accent? Nobody in normal life, right? <laughs> Nobody in normal life. That is for sure. <laughs> Right. This is fascinating, Robert. Um, I'm sure people that are listening to this are going to want to know more. So where where can they go to find you, the book, the next thing you're doing? Where, what's the best way to connect with you? Uh, yeah, go to my website. It's robertkerbeck.com, K-E-R-B-E-C-K, robertkerbeck.com. Uh, there's a lot of fun stuff on there. Obviously, you can go and buy Ruse um, you know, from wherever you like to buy books. Um, but there's some fun things on there. The book trailer is on there. The publisher did a really cool trailer for the book, which is fun and gives a, a sense of a lot of the things we're talking about, mm-hmm. uh, about how valuable this information is. Um, and then there, you know, other books I've written, short stories I've written. Um, there's some links to some films I've written. Um, so yeah, so there's a lot of cool stuff. Um, we, we have a couple of questions. We always ask people, um, obviously, you know, you got to this place in your life, you mentioned a few people, but do you have any mentors that you would say that without them in your life, you just wouldn't be where, where you are? Yeah. You know, I think, uh, and it just kind of came to me in our call today, uh, that professor, uh, my freshman year, I was at uh, Drexel University, and Drexel was known as a kind of an engineering school, and and that wasn't really the road I wanted to go down. And and but this guy was teaching English, and he read a paper I wrote, and he said, "What are you doing at this school? Like you, you're a good writer, you should go to a school where you know." And so I did. I transferred to the University of Pennsylvania and became an English major. And so that that professor basically changed my life. And here I am after not having written for most of my life. <laughs> having circled back to now being a, a, a full-time that professional really writer. Cool. That is really cool. Yeah. Um, and you mentioned Frank so many times that um, it just, it just, oh. I mean, I've, ne- I've, I've never <laughs> met the man and yet he continues to generously support me and promote me. I mean, you know, that is just is, an amazing thing. Uh, of course, we're going to put the, the link to your website and your book in our show notes, but in addition to your book, are there any books that you read that doesn't even be on this topic? It could be just be a book you read that you're like, man, this is a great book. Everyone should read this. It doesn't matter what's, what it's about. Well, I got to promote my friends that have promoted me. So Frank Abagnale, everybody yep. knows the movie, right? And the movie was very good. But the book, as yeah. usual, you know, we always say the book is better than the movie. The Catch Me If You Can book is amazing. And there's scenes in the book mm-hmm. that are not in the film that – that you're like, why yeah. do they not put that in the film? You know, uh, so I really recommend that book. And then also, um, as I said earlier, I did an event with former CIA's, CIA's by Valerie Plame and her book, Fair Game, is phenomenal. I mean, what, uh, you know, when I was with her, I said, you're the most famous CIA agent ever outed by their own government. And she said, Robert, I'm the only CIA agent ever outed by their own government. And that really was like, wow, like the only person in American history that was outed. Um, so her book is just a crazy story, too. Yeah, and I, I recommend that. I haven't read that one. I have to read that. I, I haven't even heard of that. So that's amazing. Uh, that sounds really fascinating. Yeah. I, I can't thank you enough for this conversation. It's, uh, it's it was truly wonderful and great and and eye opening and uh, and everything <laughs> you, you did and are doing sounds like it, it's a it's a great it's going to be a great thing for society for security. I thank you for sharing it all and for coming on the show today. Really, I do. Uh, well, if I can ever be of service to you, uh, you need anybody to show you a little offense and how it goes. I'm great. happy to do it. So everyone is listening. Thank you for coming and joining Robert and I today. Um, you know, please uh, check out his website, robertkerbeck.com. Uh, we'll have that in the show notes, so you can check that out and a link to his book, Ruse, uh, Lying the American Dream from Hollywood to Wall Street. You can take a look at that. And thank you for joining us on the show today. And uh, just join us next month for another amazing guest. We'll talk to you guys soon. 